and welcome to the research and publication seminar series. I am very glad to introduce Professor Manish Verma as the speaker for the day. Professor Manish Verma uh, is an associate professor of operations management and management sciences at the Degroot School of uh, Business at McMaster University in Canada. Uh, he has an MBA and a PhD from McGill University again in Canada. Uh, his research interests are in multimodal transportation of dangerous goods, risk assessment, network design and planning issues in transportation, global logistics, and green supply chain management. Uh, his most of his research projects have been funded by Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council and Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, which are the uh, two of the most prestigious funding agencies in Canada. Uh, Manish has uh, been very prolific in his publications and his publications have appeared in most of the leading international journals in transportation and operations research, namely in transportation research B, D and E, computers and operations research, European Journal of Operational Research and Transportation Sciences. So I will hand it over to Manish. Uh, today he is going to talk about disruption and resilience issues in Thank you, Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. So what I'm going to do over the next, uh, depending on how often you guys interrupt me and depending on the next 45 minutes, one hour, uh, I'm going to share with you some of my experiences with a couple of uh, recent research projects we have undertaken. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so. Disruption and resilience issues in freight transportation. So uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things which I have done with my uh, doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows. Presentation outline. So I'm going to briefly introduce the topic, uh, talk about intentional uh, disruption, but uh, primarily focus on random disruption, which is the focus of the talk, and uh, leave you with some possible research questions. And if you're interested, you can investigate these uh, further. Uh, freight transportation is crucial to industrial society uh, as you, yeah, and it should not really come as a surprise to you that uh, in general, producers and consumers are not really at the same location. And transportation is the only way how you're going to connect them. Uh, in North America, the, this connectivity is essentially ensured through an extensive freight transportation system comprised of both uni and multimodal combinations, surface and marine. Uh, interestingly, the volume transiting the transportation infrastructure, it has been, incre it has been increasing every year. Uh, unfortunately, the investment, in the investment in the infrastructure hasn't really kept pace with the increase in volume. And as a result of which, you have these uh, infrastructure or different elements operating at or near capacity. The, the problem is that uh, that at or near capacity is good from utilization perspective, but you just do not have enough buffer in case anything goes wrong. You do, do not have enough buffer to absorb these kind of disturbances or disruptions in the system. So we are uh, making the case that every effort should be made towards extracting maximum utilization from this given set of assets. Plus we are saying that this one of the ways to do this is of course you have to maintain the assets appropriately. You have to invest in the infrastructure, you have to carry out the appropriate maintenance program. And our interest is mostly in protecting these assets from disruption, both of the intentional kind as well as random disruptions to the system. So uh, very briefly, my own research engagement or output, if you want to say, has primarily been in this space, wherein, which is uh, developing analytical methodologies or techniques to uh, investigate the safety, security, and resilience issues in freight transportation. I will talk just about the resilience issues, I would say here, disruption and resilience issues in freight transportation. 
Uh, however, most of the work that I have done in the past 15 years, it does fall under this hazmat transportation domain, which, which deals with safety issues. And we talk about risk management, risk management techniques, risk assessment techniques, how can you reduce risk in the network. And uh, we have contributions uh, in pretty much all modes of transportation you can see except air transportation. But uh, there is a reason why, why we do not have contribution in the air transportation of hazmat domain because you don't really use air that much to move hazmat shipment. It could be only small packets once in a while. Anyway, so, uh, but in the recent past, I have, uh, I have become interested in, in disruption. Uh, intentional disruption is one of the types wherein the idea is, uh, idea is to, as, a, as the good guy, you have a finite budget and you want to invest this budget into protecting the given infrastructure such that the malice or the, let us say, the ill intention of a terrorist or attacker, you are able to minimize the impact of that. So that's the space that we have done some work. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that piece today. What I'll focus on is here, uh, random disruption. More specifically, I'll talk about rail transportation system a random disruption within rail transportation system, specifically freight transportation. So I'll not talk about passenger transportation. I think uh, we have a colleague here who is uh, an expert in passenger transportation. She can uh, comment uh, offline, of course. You cannot take my time uh, here. So. Uh, and, and plus, we have also started uh, looking at something within a manufacturer supplier context. Again, random disruption affecting the supplier and how it impacts the yield. But, but I'll talk about rail transportation primarily. So intentional transportation, just to motivate this, uh, it is a very important uh, topic now. And I don't really have to provide you with that many evidence. If you reflect on what has happened over the past two years or so, you would come across numerous instances of attacks on the transportation system across the world. Uh, University of Maryland in the US maintains a database which is called START. So that's, that would be statistics on terrorism attack and response to terrorism. So that's the acronym for it. And they essentially, so, so the database essentially lists over 6,000 attacks on the terror, uh, transportation infrastructure. And another agency, uh, this one owned by the US Department of Transportation, well, the US government, I should say, and it's called National Counterterrorism Center. So they also list that uh, the proportion of attacks has increased 34% on transportation infrastructure. Now, the, so uh, this has to tell you that it is a fairly important area which requires further investigation. If you think about Brussels, if you think about what happened in Istanbul recently, so all those are transportation assets. And Istanbul had all those security parameters, but still something went wrong somewhere. Uh, India, we have been quite fortunate that way, I would say, and in an ironical way, I'm saying thanks to what happened in the late 70s, 80s here. Security situation is much better at Indian airports. We may be inconvenienced quite a bit, but, but it's very difficult to uh, get to the terminal with a weapon or something here. I, at least I want to believe that. Nevertheless, so disruption management literature, it has uh, adopted two approaches primarily. So the first is that uh, in order to tackle disruption, they would say that, uh, well, why don't I completely redesign the infrastructure from ground up uh, so that uh, the, the infrastructure operates efficiently both normally and when a disruption occurs. Dr. Jaiswal is looking at some of these things with his uh, uh, research teams. Uh, the problem here, or not the problem, but the challenge here is resources. This approach is going to be prohibitively expensive because you have to do everything from scratch. And we know that in reality, all of us have to deal with finite resources, finite budget. So 
some of the other researchers what they do is they say that okay, so I am just going to look at the existing infrastructure and see what can I do to protect the, uh, protect the infrastructure from attacks. So that is sort of equivalent to trying to ascertain the vulnerability of the infrastructure and you identify the critical links and then you make a decision about where you are going to invest the money so that you are able to solidify those links to attacks. So that's the space where uh, we did some stuffs. Uh, very, very quickly, a rail truck intramodal system, most of you are familiar with this. So the idea here is that, uh, I think this should be the one, right? Pointer is here. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Thank you. So, so the shippers are here and the receivers are here. Both the shipper and the receivers are connected to the intramodal terminals using trucks, which we call drayage. And then you have these intramodal train services operating between the terminals. Now the question is that if you have a finite budget, which terminal should you protect? So that was the area that we looked at. We only focus at disruption at the terminals. And then we essentially identified some, some strategies to fortify this. Uh, the approach we adopted, we said that there are three players here. Uh, we'll have a network operator who, who is also the owner of the network. And that person or that agency has to make a decision about where to invest finite resources to protect a given number of terminals. And that information or that action is visible to this guy, the bad guy. And, and, the, and the bad guy essentially also has a finite budget, fortunately. And he or she is going to invest that or rather make use of that to inflict maximum damage on the system. And finally, you have another good guy here, which is the intramodal operator, which essentially is uh, rather who is responsible for meeting the demand on this reduced network. So that decision happens here. So there's, so you can see it will be, it is going to result in a tri-level, a three-level mathematical formulation, which will be pretty interesting to solve. And it will have its own challenges, but thankfully I don't have to talk about that piece here. So what, what I will focus on is random disruptions. So, so in this case, anything ha can happen anywhere in the network. We do not know where it's going to happen. Just to motivate this piece, uh, freight railroad network is pretty huge in North America. Uh, over 16 million, 1600 million tons in the United States and just a quarter of that in Canada. The more interesting thing or the thing which may surprise you, which is different from the Indian context, is that in North America, freight railroad is not really owned by the government. It's, it's essentially private companies which operate. So look at this number, over 570 different railroad companies are coordinating with each other so as to ensure smooth and efficient flow of freight. That's a huge task if you think about this. If you talk to someone from uh, organizational behavior or marketing, people who deal with negotiation, they will tell you that it's not an easy task because you do not have a central authority controlling things here. It's just the mutual interest of these companies that they, they want to ensure smooth uh, operation. Now against that backdrop, uh, we essentially contend that uh, subpar operation of this, of a, such an integrated network, it is going to not only result in unfavorable customer service, but more than that, it is going to have a real adverse effect on the economy because of the significance attached with uh, freight, rail freight uh, shipments in North America. So now, Typically, disruptions is going to result in one of these two things. Uh, you may have to reschedule trains. You may have to cancel some trains. You may have to reroute if you have options to reroute. And in some cases, you may, have to, you may not have any way to move things. Because if that's the only link connecting two points, but you want to meet demand at the other location, what do you do? 
you may have to resort to some third party contractors who is going to bring in the shipments. And that in general will cost you a lot of money. So it is not infrequent. Uh, just for one single track segment, Seattle to Vancouver on the west coast, uh, there were 61 disruptions registered over a five year period. That translates into five disruptions, basically 12 disruptions a year. One, one disruption every month, which is pretty significant if you think about this from a broader perspective, how much money it will cost you and, and the inconvenience. Okay. I've already talked about some of this. Uh, so what I will focus on here is, I'm going to focus on random disruptions to tracks and I'll use the term tracks and service legs interchangeably. Uh, service leg for, uh, uh, service leg in this context means, um, context means that a freight train, when I say it has four service legs, it essentially means that the first service leg is the non-stop, rather track segment on which the train is going to travel non-stop between the first two yards and so on. So track, service leg essentially refers to the track segment on which it travels non-stop. Uh, strategies for disruption risk management, you can have mitigation strategy, you can have disruption strategy. Mitigation strategy, typically it is done before the disruption happens, so you are being proactive in this case. Uh, but the problem is that once you, so because it is done ahead of time, so typically you enter into some sort of a contract with some other party and you will incur the money irrespective of whether the disruption happens or not. It will be incurred. Recovery strategy is post-disruption, so that obviously is a function of whether disruption will happen or not. So that is incurred, I should say, only if a disruption uh, happens. Yes. It will be a combination in general because as I'm going to talk about in a minute, it will be a combination. So, so mitigation strategy, for, for example, within a railroad context, if you think about this, the idea is that you want to add new routes. New routes would mean you're going to lay new tracks. And that will cost you a lot of money. Now, now the question is, unlike the Indian context, whether you have that kind of money to invest or not ahead of time without really knowing whether you're going to use those tracks at all. Recovery strategy, on the other hand, is sort of after it has happened, you have a choice of making use of one of these strategies. So within a supply chain management context, I would say it is a combination of these two things. It will be a common, but, but obviously, obviously what, what, what proportion, whether it's an equal mix or a, one is heavier than the other, it really depends on the context. So I wish I had a straight answer. I don't. But thank you for that question. That's a good question. So uh, three things that we will try to answer here. Uh, what kind of tactical measures should be adopted so that I, I can bring the network back on track at the least possible cost? Uh, how should we redesign the network so that you are able to minimize the impact of future disruption? So this could fall within this robust design kind of thing if you think about this. Uh, and then uh, how can we measure the impact of mitigation strategies? So what we have done is we have proposed a methodology, so a set of steps that you have to go through in order to solve this problem. So broadly speaking, it could be categorized into pre-disruption period and post-disruption period. Pre-disruption period has five steps. And, in the, and I'm going to through, go through all of them. In step one, what I do is I solve a minimum cost flow problem, if you will. So I'm just solving a, route, a typical routing problem uh, with and assuming that the network, given network, is working in its normal state. So there is no disruption. 
ok. So, it is working. So, that will give me some cost numbers and then in step 2 what I do is I go in and I conduct this sensitivity analysis if you will, but I am, but, but, but we were calling it what if disruption scenario. So, what I do is rather what we do here is we look at the given network and for every link in that network or every service leg in that network we go in and we evaluate what is the importance of that service leg in the network and we essentially solve an optimization problem uh, assuming assuming that that specific service leg is disrupted. So, I would solve this every time. Uh, I would solve this as many times as the number of service legs in the network and then these two numbers cost numbers is going to let me identify purely based on cost for the moment uh, what are the critical service legs in the network. So, critical I mean which links are more important than the others. I just have a ranking scheme here. I will talk about that in a minute. Uh, once I have identified these critical service legs then I will go back and talk about some mitigation strategies. Of course, you have to keep this in mind that the mitigation strategies have to be within the railroad transportation context. It cannot just be mitigation strategy which will not really work in this. So, it has to be appropriate to the context. So, I will apply the mitigation strategy just to the critical service legs. So, that I have some options around that service leg and then I am going to update my network structure and when I say update my network structure for example, as you are asking let us say I decide that I have to lay new tracks around a critical service leg. So, the, the addition of the or the insertion of this new track is going to result in a new network. So, the network has to be updated and so that is my pre disruption period and then I wait for and I do not think it is the right way to say, but I wait for the disruption to happen and that disruption provides me with some input parameters about capacity loss location and so on. I go back and solve the model again and then so the, the process continues ok, okay, no, I do, okay right. I, I, Right, I don't think I should say the process continues, but but I'm just going to solve this one shot depending on the input parameter you give me. Questions, comments. What would be the timeline of this planning? Of the planning? See, if you are going to say that you are going to modify or update the network strategy, uh, how would we start to end? Because you know, most of the Upstream things, you speak about all the strategic or policy decisions, these come under your operation or your real time decisions. How do you connect them? You know, I, I just don't get this uh, updating the network strategy at the fifth step. You know, I don't know, uh, you know, basically the timeline of that. This is, a, this is a totally an operation control thing. The post decision is totally an operation control thing. Both things are totally strategy related. So, hopefully, I will. Right. So, hopefully I would answer that in the next half hour or so that part ok. But, but I, but it is a good point. So, so obviously the idea is that uh, because I am doing this pre processing ahead of time. So, mitigation strategy I already know what the mitigation strategy would be. No, 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 re no rerouting ok. Rerouting is a recovery strategy. So, there is a difference there. Mitigation strategy I have not really talked much about that. I just said there is a mitigation strategy. Uh, rerouting strategy is going to follow disruption. So, yeah, this will come under the previous Well, let me wait and see. Yeah, I think you should wait and see. Good idea, I should say. Okay, so uh, the the idea here is that uh, what was the idea? So the idea here is that uh, once 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 I have information on the disruption location along with the other relevant parameters, I can just run the model 
and then it will tell me what should be the recovery strategies that I should employ. So, that is the objective, uh, that is the objective, but I want to do this for the entire network just no, not just a single link. So, I am going to introduce the network and then take you through that and hopefully I would have answered that question, but the timeline, yes, so timeline thing that you are talking about is a tactic. So, typically freight transportation, so you do not really solve this every day because you just have to wait for the freight to accumulate before you can dispatch a rail. That is what I am saying, so you have to wait for freight to accumulate before you can justify the movement. So, we assume a week. Right, so, so we essentially assume a weekly time horizon here, weekly trains, which is what we assume in this case. Uh, but now you have intramodal trains, which is the other area we look at, which is more schedule based. You do not wait for the uh, traffic accumulation. But in this case, because it is sort of looking at the traditional freight uh, railroad, so that is weekly. Okay. So, here is the pre disruption model, and uh, I do not know whether I should bore you with mathematical details, but it is just very straightforward uh, variation of multi commodity flow problem. I have some cost there, it is flow cost, that is a uh, fixed cost to move different types of train in the network, and then followed by a couple of constraints on capacity. So, this is the capacity at the nodes, that is the number of trains required in the network. Here is the demand fulfillment and then I have uh, the assignment of uh, different itineraries associated with different demands and uh, traffic is going to flow only if those, those itineraries are available. And then finally, I have here transportation time associated with a particular itinerary R associated with demand J has to be less than equal to whatever is the delivery time specified for demand J. So, that is a very straight, a very simple uh, variant of multi commodity flow, it is nothing, nothing challenging in this problem. So, what should be the objective of minimizing the delay? It is minimization of cost. Minimization of cost. Minimization of cost which comprises of two elements. Uh, transportation cost associated with moving individual rail cars plus the fixed cost to provide different train services because rail cars cannot move on its own, right? So, it is not really trucks. So, you have to move them in a, a light, sort of sort of convoy kind of thing. So, that is what this is looking at. There is a fixed cost to provide different trains of type Z. And a train service typically is defined by origin, destination, route, number of stops. So, all those things are embedded inside that index Z. Okay, so, post disruption model, which is what we are interested in. So, we are assuming some things here. We are saying that uh, if a disruption happens on a service leg, the, the train is going to lose either partial capacity or full capacity. I will show this. To, so, that, okay, so, that may assume to be a very strong assumption, but the model is general enough to incorporate any kind of loss in capacity. If it is 0 or it is 1 percent or it is half a percent, it will take care of that. Uh, what we assume, unlike, not unlike the real world, is if, if you have a 100 rail car freight train and it meets with an accident. 20 of the rail cars are destroyed, then the railroad industry is not going to gut their remaining 80 as well. So, they will try to extract that. They will move it back to the closest yard or depending on the situation, if there is an alternative track, then, then it will try to move it using that alternative track, which is what happens in reality. So, you do not, unless the contents of the rail car is destroyed, you do not really leave it at site. You have to move it and you are going to try to extract it. Now, here are the four distinct recovery strategies that, that we are going to look at. We will say that all those, uh, all those uh, let us say undamaged or, uh, or extracted rail cars, it could be rerouted from the site of disruption. Now, that raises the question, how are you going to reroute them from the site of disruption if there is a disruption? I will talk more about that, but we are adopting a scenario based approach here. So, we have this project management crashing concept, 
we say that you could conceivably have a number of repair scenarios wherein the repair time is going to vary inversely with the amount of money that you are spending to fix that link. So, that is one of the strategies we do. Uh, repair of the repair of the disturb okay, I, I think I talked about that already. You can obviously resend everything from the origin nodes. If the entire train is destroyed, then you can you may have to resend shipments. And of course, we have this emergency fulfillment using third party because the idea is that uh, in the real world, you do have to meet them. You just cannot say that I met with an accident, so I'll not not really fulfill my obligation. Um, is there a do nothing approach? Because no. Well, how do we do that? Okay, because I'm thinking, you know, if there was a disruption, if things were destroyed, you know, it might be cheaper to just um, do not really claim the insurance and then just say, sorry, can't meet your contract. We'll yeah. and then we'll get the insurance. Uh, so, okay, so that is an interesting question. So, so, so the, okay, so typically the insurance, the railroad companies are going to carry insurance for hazmat cargo. But the typical regular freight, shippers have the responsibility of carrying the appropriate insurance. But I would be surprised if the insurance company is going to pay the customer if you are unable to meet demand. What, what made typical, because, because all these things are looked at when, when the uh, customer and the supplier write out the contract, all these, all these scenarios are already played out. So, what may happen if you are not really getting to the uh, location in time? So, railroad companies are, is not, not, so the railroad company is never going to pick up the tab for that. Insurance company may pick up partially. But it's ultimately it's the responsibility of the supplier. Okay. Okay. So let me give you a very, very quick illustrative example. Uh, we have a pre-disruption scenario. I'm sending hundred rail cars from A to E. There are two, uh, and the delivery uh, due date is seven days. There are two itineraries. One is A B E. The other one is A, B, C, D, E. And we assume that A, B, E is the one which is being used currently. Disruption happens at location K. And we are assuming that uh, it is happening on the third day of the week. It results in 40 percent loss of capacity. So, obviously, the other 60 percent or 60 rail cars could be retrieved from this location. So, how, what are the possible uh, recovery strategies for this particular example? Here is how it will work. So, what we can do is, so that was the original link here, that one. Repair strategy is going to entail that I am going to repair that link and we apply project management approach there as I said earlier and try to repair this. And of course, the idea is that uh, in the numerical experiments, we are ensuring that you have repair scenarios uh, wherein the, the repair time is going to be short enough so that you can still uh, make, make, the, make the destination. But if it is not short enough, then obviously, we always have this emergency supply, emergency third party provider who will take care of things. So, uh, that is what is depicted here. So, it is just an illustration of different uh, recovery strategies. So, we have rerouting. We bring the, uh, bring the undamaged rail cars back to the nearest yard, which is what is done. And then you route it through alternative itineraries, alternative routes. Uh, and as you can see, we are saying that now, because disruption has happened, you have only four days of the original seven days available to meet demand, meet demand in this case. So, uh, this is how it is going to work, which is, a, which, which is the idea in this case. It does not talk about mitigation strategy anywhere. That is specific to the problem. I will come to that in a minute. So, are we okay with the setup? Actually, the scenario will be multiple suppliers and multiple locations where you go through the same. 
So our origin and destination source is necessary to be fixed, but there will be multiple origin and destination source. So, so well, but that, in that case, my critical route will change based on what origin and destination is. Very good. You have killed the presentation man already. That's the, that's the essence of the presentation. Exactly. So that will emerge but, but at the moment I'm just focusing on one OD pair. But you are right. So depending on the OD pairs, it's going to be different. Absolutely. Yes. Um, if the destruction happens in a rural area, then will that change some of your strategies? Because it could be days before you know, bears must get up to the mountainside. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So, which is what I meant by project map. We basically have some, well, we have some interval within which we simulate different uh, repair, let's say, repair times. And then associated with those repair times, we may have a uniformly distributed cost, which, which, which we generate randomly because you have to understand that it is quite difficult to get hold of real information associated with that. So, you just best you can do is to do a simulation kind of thing over all values to see what could potentially happen if the repair time is 5 hours or 10 hours. But which is, which, which is one of the challenges, how accessible the disruption location is, fair point. So, so here is the post disruption model which is what we are interested in. Uh, once again, I'm trying to minimize cost here. Uh, it has few additional elements. This element was present in the earlier context also, but now we are using a new term. We are saying how many rail cars associated with a specific demand is passing through a service leg which is not disrupted. Okay, not disrupted. Second element is looking at uh, number of rail cars passing through the disrupted service leg. That is again coming from before number of train services. Here is the uh, repair cost associated with different scenarios S. And finally, I have emergency shipment option there. And just, just like before, I have uh, capacity on node here, number of trains. This is essentially saying uh, let me just remember what is that saying. Yes, yeah, so it's it's basically saying the uh, so this is my demand. What is my oh so that's my yeah so that's my uh, so itinerary. Okay, so this is my demand here, which is just reflecting what is going from the origin, what is coming out from those artificial nodes, plus the emergency response is equal to my demand. Uh, I'll come to constraint 11, it's not coming to me what, what, what that is. Uh, 14 and 16 is looking at essentially the use of it available itineraries and fulfillment of demand using uh, links which are not disrupted. 15 and 17 are looking at links which are disrupted. And then this is saying that uh, the repair scenario, you, you have to use only one repair scenario. And, the, and this is essentially saying that you, so, so you cannot use a specific link until which is damaged until you have repaired it. Okay. Absolutely right. So, so what we what what we ensure is that whatever routes you are taking, you are able to get to the destination before the specified time. So you cannot delay things. So we are ensuring that. But but what 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 you are asking is relevant. But in this case, because of this assumption, 
that you have to fulfill demand within the specified time or else you always have the option of fulfilling the demand after the due date. So this is specific only if you are using rail option. That is trucking option emergency service provider. So that is more expensive as you are rightly suggesting. But that does not use any rail component in that. So that, that is coming from some other uh, infrastructure. Okay. So here is the network, the realistic network that we use, which, which, which I generated in one of my earlier works, but it's very handy. It does, it does allow us to uh, calibrate a lot of, of, of our work. So it, it belongs to what we call a class one railroad operator in North America. It's Norfolk Southern's uh, network in Midwest US. And it is essentially telling you that there are 25 yards in this network. We are assuming that each yard is both a supply and a demand point for the other 24 yards. So you can think about this, it's a 24, it's 25 by 24 demand matrix, which essentially results in 600 OD pairs that you're dealing with. We further assume that between each OD pair, you have between one and four itineraries. And very simply, itinerary means there is uh, how many ways you can route shipments, rail cars, from the origin yard to the destination yard, for a total of 1338 itineraries. Uh, we have a total of 31 train services. But what, what you should focus more on is these train services are collectively accounting for 53 service legs. So this is a service leg for me. So that is what I want to focus on in this piece. Uh, basically, for this network, we want to uh, assess which service, what is the criticality index of each service leg in the network. Okay. Uh, now we, we did generate a number of other input parameters, uh, such as uh, repair scenarios that I was talking about. We, we consulted the open literature, including some of our own work, a peer-reviewed literature, I should say, for some cost numbers associated with uh, fixed cost to employ a train and uh, so on. So I'm not really, I haven't listed them here, but I can assure you there are other input parameters which will go in here. So we solved this using the pre-disruption model. And I don't know whether you can see this, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's a wrong choice of back, background color. So what, just to, uh, just to uh, conduct a focused analysis, what I do here is, uh, what, what I'm presenting before you is, I'm just focusing on a specific service leg of a train. So that's sh Chicago to Northbrook, which is here, here. And this is a part of a train that starts in Chicago and goes to Middlesbrough. So that's what it says, Chicago to Middlesbrough. So I'm just focusing on a specific service leg just to show you how this is going to work. And then you can extrapolate from that for the entire network, so which is what the intention is. So what this is telling you is that uh, here, what is the before and after disruption cost? This is the total cost associated with itineraries that are using the non-disrupted service leg. So these itineraries are not using that service leg. But this is the total cost for the itineraries using that specific service leg. And you can see the benefit of our disruption model that this total cost before disruption, it was uh, uh, roughly 3.6 million, it has gone down to 3.45 million. That's the benefit of applying this technique. Uh, I'll talk about uh, some, of the, some of the insights in a minute. Uh, and here is the fixed cost associated with different trains. This column is telling you the repair strategy, the amount of money spent on repair strategy. The second last column is the amount of money spent on emergency strategy. You can see that both these numbers are zero, which should not be surprising because if you're solving the model in normal case, 
everything is working fine. So, those numbers would be 0. And then we have some information here. Uh, so, as a result of applying this model, what is happening, the important thing is here, and all those are dollar numbers. Important thing is here, 65 fewer itineraries are using the disrupted service leg as a, as a result of applying the post-disruption model. And why is that happening? Because of some alternative things that we are providing to the model, which, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay. If you want to go deeper to see what else is going on, here are the 31 train services. And all this solution is, is related to the previous slide, obviously. So it's, and, and you can tie everything together. Uh, that was the train that we were focusing. So what is happening in this case, what we notice is that one fewer train is required in the post-disruption scenario. And the reason is roughly 40 odd rail cars. Uh, so the, the train from in Cleveland to Chicago, earlier it was five, now it's four. So that is happening because 40 fewer rail cars are using that train now, because these rail cars are being moved using or other itineraries, alternative itineraries or trucking option, trucking options. So that may not be very evident yet. Okay. Now, think about this. So that was the simulation or what if analysis for just one service leg. We do the same thing for all the other service legs in the network. There are 53, so it's being, so, so that model was run 53 times, assuming that there is a disruption on one of these service legs and a train moving on that service lane, okay? So that this is essentially telling you the number of trains using that service leg. This is telling you the volume of rail cars using that service leg before disruption in normal state. And that's an important column, by the way, these two. Uh, column number five, it is telling you what is the average ratio of itineraries using the disrupted service leg. So for example, if I can just, just draw your attention to these numbers here, so it, it has been sorted in some fashion. So the Jackson, Jackson to Lansing service leg, a total of 827 rail cars is passing this service leg. And the ratio of itinerary, so it says 23.5% of the total itineraries are using that service leg. So that's an important result. So that is an indicator of how important that, that service leg is. Because if you think about this, as was being pointed out, that if a service leg is being used by a number of, or other, rather, okay, so I should rephrase, if a service leg connects or is the only link between a number of OD pairs, if you take that service leg out, then you are sort of crippling the entire OD pairs of basically all of, all of them which, which, which are linked only through that service leg. So this is sort of an indicator that this service leg is very important for me, uh, because 20, a total of 23.5% of the itineraries are passing through that service leg. If I take that out, a quarter of the demand would have to be met using emergency strategies or some other more expensive uh, routing options. So which is also the reason why these numbers are very, obviously you cannot read that. I apologize for the uh, resolution. But those, but that, I can assure you that number is very, very high. So it's almost 16.6 million, and that's the largest number in this column. So you can, and on the contrary, if you look at anything up there, for, for example, Lansing to Detroit, only 16 itineraries are using that service leg, and which, which essentially results, translates into 1.2 as the ratio. You can see, even if the disruption happens, no money is spent on either trying to fix that link or to send anything using emergency strategy. And that's because there are enough alternative options there that you can use. You don't have to, you don't have to use all, you don't have to use the, you do not need to use the expensive uh, emergency strategy. Unlike here, because here you, 
you may not have that choice. You are maybe you will be forced to use that because you do not have that option. So, so we did this, and obviously, so that's the that's that's just based on. Uh, uh, I, I, okay, I should tell you that we did experiment with a number of other input elements, such as number of uh, number of itineraries using a service leg. And I'll talk about in a minute. That was sort of redundant, given that I already had this this information present in my model. So that was discarded in favor of this ratio, which makes more sense if you are familiar with uh, network routing literature, or if you know about this reliability issues. You will appreciate that it makes sense to have dissimilar paths between a given OD pair, because if one path is taken out, then at least you have the other one. So that's the inherent. Uh, that is inherently what's happening in this case. Okay. So uh, we focused on. Uh, we we said that okay. So let's just focus on the OD pairs which are using emergency strategies. So I think there is a total of 60 odd OD pairs using emergency strategies. Now we, we looked closely at some of this because the emergency cost is quite high. Well, the amount of shipments going on using the emergency option is quite high here. So we looked at the reason, and it, and it emerged that the reason, again, that these OD pairs are using, because that's the only way to move shipments. If you want to meet demand, you have to resort on a third party provider or else you cannot. Questions? So, we postulated, if you will, that demand volume and ratio of itineraries are two of the important predictors which could enable me to estimate which link is critical in the network. So we are saying that those are two critical factors. And then what we do is we essentially go to go and develop a multiple multiple regression model where these are two independent predictor variables. And my predicted variable obviously is what is the post disruption cost. So we, we run this on the given data set. And here is the solution. So, so you can, you will, or you may want to argue that the explanatory power of this model is not really very, very high. It's around around 58 percent. But uh, and then I'll counter by saying that if you remember, what happens is that the the p values here, it is doing both things. The low p values, it is, it is validating the overall significance of the regression model and also the partial significance of these two independent variables. Those numbers are very, very low. So of course, the R square, I guess, you know, within, within a classroom setting, we want it to be close to 99% or 90%, but uh, may or may not, in reality, that will not really happen all the time. So it, it essentially tells me that I can get my job done. So, so what do I want to do with this, first of all? So, I sorted all those links. I know which are critical based on these two measures. Now I'm going to make use of this regression equation to predict, given the general behavior of the network, I'm going to predict that, yes, I have my actual, I have my actual cost here, sorry, here. But based on the overall model behavior and the multiple regression, what should be my expected cost or what should be my predicted cost following disruption? Is the question clear about what I'm trying to do here? It's so we adopt this AVC criticality measure, uh, which is used to estimate risk profiles, very, very popular technique. So what you see here is all those OD pairs. And we compute two things. We compute that based on the regression equation, what should be the post disruption cost associated with each of these OD pairs, rather each service leg, sorry, each service leg here. And then I already have the actual disruption cost in that table, the last column of the table. I go in and I compute the residuals. 
So the difference between expected and actual the residuals and I plot the residuals here. So if the residual is positive, it means my actual cost is more than what it should be. If it is less, if it is negative, then it's a good thing in this context. It means the actual cost is less than what you are expecting it to be. Now you will see that we are using a very elegant color scheme. I think amber and green, green means good. Amber is a bit problematic. So what we do is we have this one standard deviation, two, this two standard deviation concept, primarily motivated from multiple regression where you, when you plot errors, you want it to be normally distributed, which is, what, which is exactly the logic we are following here. So, so I have this two standard deviations. So this, whatever numbers are beyond this is problematic for us because that is telling me that my actual number is way more than it should be. And I want to investigate the reason why. So I'm still trying to go further into uh, trying to understand why these numbers are so high. Hopefully I can employ some strategy to improve this thing. And my learning, mind you, is going to come from these guys down here. Why are these guys behaving so nicely? Do you get that point? So uh, these guys, these numbers are really very good in my opinion because the actual cost is less than the predicted cost. And the converse is the case here. So I want to learn from these guys. And again, the, when, when you go in and you investigate, you see that for these service legs, you essentially have alternative routing options. Alternative routing options, which unfortunately is not the case for folks up there. So that could be one of the ways how you can uh, tackle disruption associated with those links and bring down the cost. Bring down the cost. So what we did is, uh, we obviously we have plotted these critical links first of all, all these critical service legs in the network. So there are 12 coming from two different techniques, 10 coming from the predictive modeling equation. There was some discussion that why don't you also make use of the last column from the table, so we did. But the last column from the table had seven entries, five of which are already here. So that left us with only two additional ones. So we, we plotted those, so there are 12. 12 uh, service legs which are critical to the functioning of this network. So what do we do? So in, uh, again, going back to the earlier point I was making, in North America, uh, railroads own the tracks, they own the equipment. And unless there is some kind of market economics motivating them, they hate to lay additional tracks. They will not, because these things cost millions of dollars. So roughly it's half a million dollar a mile of track. And they will not do this. And we have, uh, we have uh, not really fought, but we have debated with them about this thing within the hazmat context. Because some of these tracks go through downtown Toronto, or downtown Washington. So unless regulators ban this, which has happened in Washington, by the way, so you cannot have a rail with crude oil tanker going very close to the White House. It cannot happen. So it has been banned altogether. So unless you do that, Railroad companies are not going to invest money because it doesn't make sense for them to do. So, so. In, in the cross border, we have five terms. See, uh, infrastructure is owned by the federal agencies. You know, the government, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, railroads are basically service providers. They run the services, right? So, if you have the minimizing the total cost, how does the repair element come there? I'm not involved in the infrastructure, I'm a railroad operator. Why should I repair the infrastructure? That's exactly what I'm saying. In North America, no, you are not listening to me. In North America, that's not the case. North America, railroad companies own the infrastructure, not the government. It's the case in India. Which is what I've been saying repeatedly, that it's not in their interest to build the tracks. Railroad companies are responsible for, for building the tracks there, not the government there. So unlike the case here, it's not the case there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, 
railroad companies, unless they have some, some kind of market incentive, they are not going to build additional tracks. And the, and the repair strategy, repair strategy has nothing to do with the government or the federal agency. Repair strategy has to do because the railroad companies, as I was responding to earlier, they are obligated to carry certain insurance liabilities for whatever they are moving. And whenever there is a disruption, it is the responsibility of the railroad company to essentially clear the tracks. Government has nothing to do with that. It may be the case here because here railroad is owned by the government. Freight or passenger, that's not the case there, So, which is, which, which is what I'm saying. And the rerouting strategy that you're talking about, so rerouting essentially in this context means that you have some alternative path to, to send shipments. So that has, that would be done because it is in the interest of the railroad company to keep the freight moving. Why are they going to keep it at the disrupted location? Sorry, I don't, I don't so I, I don't really know whether I answered your question or not. It is from the perspective of the railroad operator who is working with the shipper. Yeah, who is working with the so this is I'm, I'm, I'm the railroad operator, I want to minimize my total cost of operations. Is that right enough? Is that fair enough? So in that there were five terms, uh, like uh, either I should uh, find out what is the cost of uh, repairing, what is the cost of rebooting, what is the cost of if nothing is possible, supply to the end destination. So I was trying to look at all those elements. That's one part. So I think I am fair enough in understanding that part. You are absolutely bang on. on, on. So, so, okay, so, so I think from a, a person. Those five terms I am trying to understand. Sure, your sure, point. absolutely. I think uh, we had five, you are right. So, so we had this, uh, so I think that the first two were pretty straightforward in the sense that you are sending shipments yeah. using non-disrupted yeah. links. Yeah. Second one, you are sending things from disrupted links. So that's the concept of virtual node that I was talking about. So you are starting things there. Yeah. If I go back to the so model. I would like to go back to the table, the uh, table as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The huge table. Yes, it is huge. Yeah, the big one. Yeah. It took a number of months to build that table. Yeah, the big huge. one. Yeah, okay. this one. So I think the the last one is the total cost. I mean, it's I the total say, cost of yeah. The last one and yeah. the and there were five. Uh, the, the previous ones had five different columns. And uh, okay, so so let me read these things for you. So this is saying what is the total cost of itineraries using the disrupted service line. This is saying the total cost of itineraries using the non disrupted service line. So, which obviously is going to exclude whichever is being disrupted. And I have a fixed cost for trains. I have here repair cost, how much money it's going to cost me. And I have emergency strategy. Emergency cost. Well, I think this is Close a, in, 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 in some columns, in some columns, uh, the, the last good one, the emergency strategy. How can it be non-zero when all others also have some values? See, the emergency thing, at the, at the worst case, I think that should be the most expensive cost factor for me, right? If I can, my no, common sense. No, absolutely. And it should yeah, be, that should be the most expensive thing. That should be the last resort I should do. Sure. So, why do I, why do I see some, uh, if I see some non-zero things, the other cost element should they not be zeros? If others work out, if the other if the other strategies work out, then why do I why do I spend on the most expensive part? I don't know if I'm No no absolutely you are absolutely right about that. No absolutely no, no, you are coming in very, very properly, very appropriately. So the emergency strategy is going to kick in only if the other cheaper routing options or recovery strategies may not work. Yeah, in certain things I see, you know, I'm fine with that. Because the previous non-emergency or, you know, something which is less expensive I worked out. So I don't want to go for the most expensive part, which I'm fine. There are certain elements which is not zero. If there is not zero, then why the other factors have to be zero now? These should be zero, you're saying? These should be yeah. zero because, because I have a pause. Just my common sense, yeah. But, but why would that be zero? So, okay, so you are essentially assuming that, 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 uh, uh, so. If nothing else worked out, I still 
Right, absolutely. So the emergency strategy option that is going to kick in only if the other cheaper rerouting options will not work. But that's not happening there. So basically what is happening in all these cases, I'm assuming disruption at 20% of the capacity. Okay, so I still have 80% which is salvageable, uh, which, uh, which, which could be brought back, which could be sent using one of the other options. Okay. But, but if re rerouting or, or rather, let's, let's say, if, if implementing one of the other three recovery strategies is not really enabling me to fulfill the entire demand on time, only then I go to the emergency strategy. But in none of these cases, that's happening. Because I'm able to meet at least, because, because, because you, have to, you, have, you also have to think about the uh, repair scenarios that I was talking about. We had, in, we, had, we had essentially simulated values which are within, which will sort of, which is going to sort of enable you to at least have multiple ways to move things, including one of them would be emergency strategy. And if I had generated repair scenarios, let us say wherein the repair time is, let's say, two months, then obviously everything is going to go on emergency in that case. But, but here the idea is that's not really happening because we, we are, by, by a design, we are essentially, because, because we wanted to investigate all those things, we essentially wanted to comment on the, the fact that even if you have all these routing strategies or recovery strategies, what is the split of traffic across them? So, so by, by design, we had come up with uh, time intervals for repair scenarios, which is going to enable you to at least fix some of the links, reroute some of them, and emergency Emergency strategy, as you're rightly saying, that is not going to be used until I'm really strapped for capa. That's right. This is the optimal solution for you. Did you go on a C plus or something? Always. Almost always. And the other thing is that you know, the required part, I think, is still, you know, see, in Indian markets, our railways operate differently. Let me take the Indian roadways. Indian roadways must be a very large cutter to the North American railroads. If I'm a drug operator, if I may, if I may, if I may, can you take some of these off my I think we will be around uh, in the interest of time. Let us continue with this and then we'll take some of these questions off my I think money should be around. No, absolutely. I would be happy to have a chat. Thank you. Thank you for controlling the situation, man. managing the situation. In the interest of time, thank you, Sachin. Okay, so you had a question as well, or what do you? Uh, I mean, so you are showing sure. well, well, sure. well, sure. easier than the question. <laughs> of course, I think you do. Uh, so you have shown well critical links, and I think some of them are coming from the numbers in the last column that you have in the table. Yes. So uh, as I was saying, so so ten of them are coming from the predictive equation model out of twelve, and seven are coming from the earlier table. And uh, that again was based on the standard deviation and the two, two standard deviation situation based on the total cost, which is what we did. But, but five of the seven are already included using the predictive modeling thing. So it's just those two additional ones, which had to be. The only question was, when do you call them as critical? I mean, of course, all of them have some cost in between. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, maybe, maybe I should have specified this when it is more than one standard deviation. Uh, Yes, sir. thank you for thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, uh, when uh, when the residual is more than a standard deviation, so so we are essentially using that classical ABC uh, classification scheme. So, critical question: Why do you want to uh, know the disruption things? You know the rules which are which are maximum utilized even before the disruption occurs. Will they not know the critical rules? That's an excellent point. Which is what because I'm in, trying in, to say. in Indian scenario. Mumbai Delhi is the most critical. So that's what I was trying to say earlier when, when I said this, that, that we experimented with one of those variables that you're talking about. So, so if you look at this table, this column does, does capture that thing that you have, the idea you have in mind. It is listing the number of rail cars traversing a link, traversing a service link, which is sort of equivalent to the passenger traffic or passenger volume on a service link, which is what you're saying. So you, Absolutely. So, which, which, which is already captured here, but that is not the so so. Uh, obviously, I, 
I am not really showing everything here, but if I just ran a simple linear regression model using this, it is very poor predictability. And it is not because, because it is not capturing all the dimensions. That is why we went back. No, based on the predictability of the model, the, the basic R square of the model, so which was the only measure plus the p values obviously. So, it was not very good model, just looking at the volume going through each link. Artificially similar, no, base, base, I do a complete enumeration as you can see. I have a network which has 53 service legs and this table reports all the 53, so it is complete enumeration. But, but the only thing which is random is the, so basically I say that one of these train services is disrupted, which is what we say because, uh, and it is very easily, you can expand that to multiple train a disruption on that link. But obviously, that, that requires some discussion about what you were having earlier, the operational details about timetabling and rescheduling, and we are not getting into that here. Yeah. So, I will conclude shortly. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, these are the 12 links, and then the idea is that can we come up with some mitigation strategies for this link? Now, one of the things which we looked at in North America, as I was saying, there are over 500 railroad companies. Each railroad company controls or owns a portion of the overall network in North America. Uh, clearly, uh, this railroad company, Norfolk Southern, may not want to build redundant links here, which may never really be utilized because these are probabilistic events. It may or may not happen. So, we postulate or we basically suggest, let us say, that one of the strategies, mitigation strategy is, why do not you go to a base, one of the competitors, they may have, let us say, they may have an alternative track here, which could be owned by that railroad company, why do not we rent that track? But, but the key here is that you pay the money up front, because it is a mitigation strategy. So, you are going to incur that cost, whether even if you do not use that. Yeah, but would it make sense? Would it make sense? So that's, and again, I do want to emphasize this. So that mitigation strategy is only within this context. So that may not work out in other scenarios, uh, especially supply chain context. It may not work out. But they have this dual sourcing strategy, which has become so popular now, which is what most of the automobile manufacturers are doing following the Asian crisis, and flexible manufacturing, that is what they do. So, those are just strategies that you are de devising and, and implementing ahead of time. So, what we do is we employ that mitigation strategy and those 12 uh, critical links, you can see we have been able to bring them into a tolerable bound just by employing that mitigation strategy. If you want to look at the details, here is the impact of that mitigation strategy for those 12, the, the solid uh, block or bar here is the increase in disruption costs uh, without that mitigation strategy and this sort of, sort of uh, fancy bar is the reduction in cost as a result of, as a result of employing that mitigation strategy. And uh, you can, do, and then, and then we finally, we also experiment with, with, with this uh, train capacity lost to disruption and uh, not surprisingly, this is going to increase as the capacity is lost. So, so, the total cost goes up and the emergency cost is also going to go up because you are losing capacity. So, you have to resort on recover, one of the recovery strategies and you can see that emergency strategy really comes into play quite a bit now. So, uh, some uh, future research uh, incorporating train timetables or scheduling, if you want to look at that. Multiple disruption events such as terrorist attacks, because one of the limitations, I think this, this paper was an exploratory work, so it's, uh, you may argue it is very simple and, and uh, I think I would, I would be happy to have a discussion with you about how we can sort of, Sort of, sort of sort of move this to a much more complicated setting wherein you have disruption and recovery which is happening at multiple locations and there is a correlation between them. You can think about those things. 
what if other disruptions occur during recovery period? There is, we have assumed exact, uh, so precise information about the uh, location as well as the uh, disruption, but, uh, the, but this is a classic thing wherein you have a lot of uncertainty or fuzziness. So that is a good area for uh, robust optimization techniques, if you will, or stochastic programming. Uh, thank you. Questions? This paper is already out in Transportation Research Part B, if you're interested in getting details on this paper. Uh, I'm more than happy to take questions either online or offline, depending on uh, how much uh, time we have. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you for being here. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Okay, let me get that correct. Sorry. Arc interdiction problem. You can solve it as an arc interdiction problem because it is a kind of disruption. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, what would be the challenge? So, so. So, when you are talking about interdiction, I think you are talking about intentional disruption. So, there you also have to model uh, what is the objective of the uh, interdictor. Uh, the problem as such is a network problem where you attack certain arcs, you know that arcs, and then the cost is But here we are talking about random disruption. Yeah, random disruption, but I think he may be on to something because it is random disruption, but because we did this complete enumeration, so we sort of have a sense of what will happen if I remove that arc from so, I think which is what you are trying to, but, but obviously it requires a different modeling as he's saying, so because you have there some, some, some kind of a two player kind, kind of a thing going on between, interdict, between the operator and the interdictor, as I was alluding to in the intentional disruption piece that I introduced. Uh, but Probably, I guess, uh, so, 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 yeah, going back to Dr. Jaswal's thing, so the objective of the interdictor will be what, maximizing cost, you're saying here? Or the attacker has a budget. Yeah, so, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, you're seeing just having groups of people. You can say, like, I have a budget of this. So, if I interdict this, I interdict this process. Right. So, would that, would that result in any different result? If I just take one link out of time, then it's just probably the same thing in a different way. Yeah. Right? Because if you, because obviously we haven't really worked with any, any budget, but, but hypothetically if I have a budget of a million dollars, it does require how much, how much will it cost to interdict a link, whether it's enough or not enough whether you can interdict part of the link or, because it's, uh, okay, so I should emphasize, it's not just interdiction of a link, but also one of the train services on that link. Because just taking a link out when there is no train, that will not result in lost capacity, right? Because you still, you, you can essentially stop all the trains before it enters that space, you can repair it. But, but in this case, we are assuming that at least one of the trains is disrupted, part of that capacity. Yeah, yeah, oh yes, yeah, yeah, we did, which was, which was the reason I had to toss out the earlier one there. So, so earlier we had a, a volume and number of itineraries using a particular service like so. So we, we realized that number of itineraries was a much more of a comprehensive, let us, let us independent variable which already contained information about volume going through that link. So, you are absolutely right. We did discover that, so we went back, and that's the reason I have that average of the ratios of itineraries going through that link. So that's that's. An so so I have two. One is the volume of traffic, and the second one is the average ratio of itineraries using the disrupted link. So which essentially means what? It means so so, so I essentially looked. To, so we have thirteen hundred and thirty-eight itineraries. And in the very last uh, service, like you saw, it was 23.5% of those itineraries were using that link. So that was sort of a, a very important measure here. So 
that will not have a dependence on the that well based on the based on the equation based on what what we are getting the partial significance it was not as high as the earlier case i think i don't think there was much because because we were sort of looking at dissimilarity index so what we did was we essentially counted the number of itineraries between each od pair how many is using that specific link and then we basically, basically we had to take the average of those so it was using but not really very very directly obviously the itinerary is a very broad thing which should capture everything but that was resulting in a very poor model so we, we went back i can assure you um, dr jaswal knows this this so oh by the way i should introduce them so he was my postdoc nadir azad and, and al kafi hasini is a colleague of mine and he's a professor nadir is a professor as well now this took us almost 18 months so it's not really so we are not justifying that within 80 minutes of class i think presentation time it does take quite a bit but but you're right so absolutely all those elements were there we went back and we re, we had to redo rerun the regression equation because that we thought was an important way so that's an independent way to arrive at the same result if you think about this we are ascertaining criticality in two different ways that total cost column that was already done in literature so that was not very important very interesting for us and as he is saying so, so in, in literature one of the researchers had already looked at what will be the cost incurred if i remove a link that was not very interesting in the sense it almost assumes that there is an alternate route between each od pair which may not happen in reality as we are showing here which is why i have the emergency strategy because you may not have that situation in reality okay we don't have any more questions then let us thank uh, the speaker thank you thank you very much for your time and uh, good luck with uh, uh, the graduate program and postgraduate program research all of your undertaking good luck thank you